earlier today in between work, I was having a discussion with a brother um, that I had known of for a while, but we kind of had our first kind of icebreaker moment to kind of build and connect. And uh, he had been talking about one of his family members that he had been witnessing to, uh, who had kind of come to a crossroads with wrestling about the reality of God and whatnot. And without disclosing too much information, we talked about just a ton of things. But one of the things that kind of reminded me of a lot of the things that I used to struggle to process through one subject in particular that always fascinated me is uh, I was reading a book by John Stott called The Cross of Christ. And he talks about the devaluing and desensitizing of the word sin. What we've done is we've abandoned the word sin culturally and we've called it a million other things. And that might not necessarily seem like a very big deal until you really kind of unpack what sin is and what the world has called quote unquote sin. We've redefined what sin is and therefore we can't be accountable to anything. So just to kind of unpack that a little bit without talking too much, this is kind of just my venting session. I'll give you an example of this. You know, you look on the internet and we see a lot of articles and memes and videos on the Black Lives Matter movement and on politics and on double standards and on homosexuality and on uh, white privilege. I mean, there's just, you, you just run down the list. There's a lot of current topics today. And you see a horrific video. We can take uh, uh, police brutality, for instance. And because we don't have any personal connection with these stories, we can only react emotionally to what we see in the moment. And then that starts to build a little narrative in our heart over time. We see these things over and over. But I say that to say, when you view something horrific over and over and you're not personally attached to it, uh, you will become subject to being desensitized. So you could fall into a situation where you're seeing a black person get murdered on camera once a day. And though it might make your stomach turn a little bit, um, it, it might only make you feel a certain way for five minutes or so. And then it's back to your grind. You won't, you don't even realize you're being programmed to, um, not have a sensitivity towards a black life, uh, or even a human life, you might see somebody of the same ethnicity as you uh, get killed and, and not even realize you've been desensitized to death itself. Um, and a lot of people can understand this, you know, if you've had a lot of people pass away in your lifetime, even if it's personal, the more you see something and you have to wrestle with it, the less personally tied to it, the more subject you are to possibly being desensitized. And why does that matter? It matters because you can fall into a situation where you no longer value something the way God would have you value it, or you can fall subject to redefining what is value, valuable about something or redefine it in a way that causes you to be justified to do a whole lot of evil. And one thing specifically that I thought about from the book from John Stott is he talks about how we've no longer called sin, sin. We'll call it breaking the law. We'll call it doing bad. We'll call it swearing. We'll call it being sick. We'll call it a defect. What is sin? That's the first question you gotta ask and that's a really important question. Sin is the breaking of God's law, the breaking of God's commands, overarching over that. Sin is anything that falls short of the glory of God. And so there's a person attached to sin by definition, and that's God. Sin is falling short of the glory of God. And so one of the biggest things from a ministry standpoint, when you're talking to people about sin um, someone always uh, told me that your conversations are either about salvation or sanctification when it comes to the ministry field. There are some people where there needs to be an emphasis of the fact that you are a sinner and how are you going to account for your sin? And on judgment day, who are you going to report to and what's that going to look like? And then you can talk about, well, 
God has only one solution for sin. And if you want to believe that we can, that our sins won't be accounted for when we die, that, you know, then we can unpack that. But like the, the primary issue that we need to be talking about isn't the abundant life, isn't the lifestyle and behavioral changes that though those things are hindering your life, the ultimate thing that's hindering your life is the fact that you need to be rescued by God. You need to be transformed by God. And you are incapable of saving yourself from the hell-bound, self-centered, autonomous desire you have that is always thinking of ways to fall short of the glory of God and be the in to chase after being the Lord of your own life. That is a sickness that you cannot get out of. And God's solution for that is one of one. And so why am I tying that in here? Well, sin is falling short of the glory of God. But if we call sin something else, we are removing God from that definition. Now sin can be the breaking of a law that belongs to somebody else. Um, and I know that might sound kind of lofty, but, but look at it like this. What makes the gospel the gospel is that you've offended God, not anybody else. The gospel is God is the Lord of all, the King of Kings. And one sin has eternally separated us from him, for, for those who are apart from Christ. And so part of accounting for your sin is recognizing who you've offended. There is no other offense that you've committed that has eternal weight in terms of the importance of trying to figure out what, do you, what are we going to do about this problem? What are we going to do about this sin problem? You can mend the breaking of a lot of different laws. I mean, you look, it's in human nature to have punishment for transgressions, but that's a God thing that started with God. And we just manifested into different expressions of that same concept, but we've taken God out of the equation. So now we're no longer offending God. We're just offending man. It's more horizontal in concept. So if you don't have to be accountable to God, you can sure enough find ways to never be accountable because maybe you don't agree with whoever created that law or that transgression that you're breaking and offending. Or you can challenge those laws and say, well, hey, if you made this law, maybe you're wrong. Maybe I'm actually right. And what man has done historically is tried to create their own law. And the Bible says uh, even man's law unto himself, the law and the rules and regulations that we've created unto ourselves, we've broken. So we're, we're not only sinning against a, a holy God who only his law is it has eternal uh, consequence to it and, and value uh, because we all report to God at the end of the day. But even in our own pursuit of trying to copy that blueprint, we've royally failed. And so it's really interesting when you talk to people about what is right and wrong, because a lot of people will try to convince you that anybody can determine what right and wrong is. Um, right and wrong is defined by the beholder. And that's just a completely unbiblical thing. Like wrongdoing is by God's definition, anything that falls short of his glory. And it's the breaking of his commands and law. It's nothing else. Uh, it's an offense to him and him alone. Now, do the things you do have consequences on everything horizontally as much as it does vertical? Absolutely. But there is an eternal consequence for this category over here, those who have offended God. And so a lot of times, rather than talking about all these lofty things and these histories and these, um, these logics and theories and this happened to me and well, how do you define this and that? You got to talk to people much more personally about where they think they stand before God, right? Because I can sit here and debate with you all day long about the laws that we have in this world. And we could talk about what stuff is 
it sounds right and what stuff sounds off and what consequences come with which laws. I mean, everybody makes laws. Your government makes laws. Your, your school teacher has laws for the classroom. Your parents have laws for how the house is governed. Um, banks have laws for how your finances work. I mean, everybody is a law unto themselves horizontally, but only one has an eternal consequence. And so it's important that you point that out like, hey, Either it's true that everybody's a law unto themselves and we're allowed to be doing that, or God is the Lord of all. He has defined what right and wrong is. And if he's right, one single wrongdoing that, that offends him separates us eternally. And if you know anything about Romans 1 or... Genesis in what Adam has passed down, Adam has passed down in his sin, we all died. We all were separated from God. And the solution for the the pass down of sin that Adam put to us, where everybody who came from the womb after Al, uh, after Adam will sin, serves themselves, regularly sins, already separate from God, based off what he did and what we do with him. God has put in place Jesus so that a new man and a new woman would come in through Jesus by faith and be born again. That's the rescue mission. And so there's only one solution. And in fact, all the life change in the world would not reconcile you with the fact that you've offended a holy God multiple times. And only one sin has the eternal consequence. You know, so... We have, an, we have a thousand pound weight tied to our feet. We are sinking to the bottom of the ocean. We have no way to save ourselves. And God has one solution for that by which he uses his Holy Spirit to transform us and draw us to him through Jesus to reconcile that separation that we deserve because of what Adam did and what we've done through, through him. So a good part of that that has kind of brainwashed our community is just the fact that we no longer call sin, sin. Um, and, and in doing that, we no longer have to be held accountable to who we're actually offending. Let's not talk right now about what happened to you or what happened to me, because if this is true, this is the only thing that matters. If sin has separated us from God, and if God is real and if God defines what sin is and wrongdoing, the difference between right and wrong is based upon what God says is right and wrong. And he says clearly that our offenses to him have an eternal consequence. Then we don't even need to talk about the marriage that you're suffering through, the addiction that you're struggling with, um, the slander that you're committing the lying and deceit and theft that you've committed. What we need to talk about is that you have a heart problem that will commit all of those things. And it doesn't matter how much we try to reconcile you in all these different categories. If your heart is not changed and rescued from its one way ticket to hell, none of this other stuff will be changed to the glory of God. It will just be behavior modification. So before we get into anything else as far as a quality of life and where we are and what we should do, what we need to do is pray that God would rescue somebody's hard heart from their one-way ticket to loving themselves, destroying themselves and those around them, and living life not to the glory of God. Until that changes, until we have a solution to sin, not just offenses to man, but to God, nothing will change. I'm curious, have any of you guys noticed in your households or in your communities or online when we talk about wrong and bad, um, how many times have we heard the word sin? And if you do hear the word sin, uh, is it only in your church or when you commit wrongdoing, uh, or, you know, things like immorality, um, pride, anger, 
do you say, wow, I'm deep in sin right now? Or do you say like, man, I have an anger problem or such and such. And in doing that, have you noticed you've become desensitized in acknowledging who you've offended and what you're going to do about that rather than just thinking, oh, well, this is a personal problem that's more horizontal than I, than I want to give credit for. So have you been desensitized to the word sin? And if so, give me an example. Tell me how. I'd love to chop this up. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's just crazy. We'll do anything to run away from our accountability to God. It's crazy.